How can co-living influence our cities? Hi, my name is Marcin Wojciech Żebrowski and this is the newest episode of Herbcast, my podcast about urbanism, architecture and many more. We tend to have more and more challenges in our cities. There are more people coming to the cities. Cities are getting bigger. Cities are also getting wider. Cities are spreading, spreading to suburbs, spreading everywhere. Unfortunately, many cities are not dense enough. We are the witness of problems connected to the urban sprawl and also the negative influence of the sprawling cities. But urban sprawl is only one of the problems. We also have different social issues and also physical, mental problems, mental sicknesses and a big pandemic, pandemic of loneliness as well. Can co-living, living together be an answer to some of those challenges? Today I will be talking to Kristen Zupancic, who is co-creating Shirt Spaces, is a freelance project manager, concept developer, placemaker, facilitator and many more. She is leading CoLive, a non-profit organization, ecosystem and Do Tank, whose mission is to empower the co-living phenomenon worldwide. They are a network of co-living professionals, founders, operators, real estate investors, developers, designers, architects, planners and policymakers who are dedicated to making the world a better place through shared living. Be aware, we will not be talking about co-housing, which is a bit different than co-living, and we will distinguish those two in a minute in our conversation. Kristen also founded Plot Twist Placemaking, in which she helps shared living models activate spaces for well-being, flexibility, and transformational experiences. She offers services in project management, concept development, research and analysis, facilitation and also place-making strategies. Kristen believes that there is no better and urgent time to make a positive social impact in the spaces that we share. And this is why she started Plot Twist to help aid and activate the built environment to make better places to live, work, learn and play. Today we will talk about the definition of co-living, the background uh, behind Co-Live, the organization that I've just mentioned, Is co-living for everyone? What challenges does it address? What influence can co-living bring to our cities? And also what is this crossover between co-living and placemaking? Welcome to the newest talk with Kristen. Kristen, welcome to to the podcast. I'm, I'm very happy that you are joining me here. Thank you so much. I'm super happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. We managed to to meet very briefly at the Urban Future Conference, which was, I think, a very good event that was bringing different perspectives onto our cities. But you are having a very particular interest that I would like to to talk about today. You are very interested in co-creating shared spaces and into co-living. Of course, I couldn't just not ask you about your interest in co-living. And could you just share with the listeners where did this interest come from? the space making and co-living especially? Absolutely. So my interest in co-living actually sprouted from my personal interests. I have a, a real mm-hmm. love for slow travel, finding really cool alternative accommodations and really just connecting with people, new people and so on. So when I was seeking out you know, places to stay on my travels and meeting new people, that search is actually what led me to what I now know as Mm -hmm. co-living. And I thought this was an amazing sort of framework and type of accommodation that all in one brings together my favorite things. And from there, I decided to explore it further. And eventually it's become my career. What is exactly the definition of co-living? Because I think that there are many things that can be placed under this umbrella of co-living, but there are also many things which are not co-living, even though we might think of them as such. So yeah, what's the definition? What's your definition? (laughs) 
So there is no straight on definition of co living <laughs> yet. Doesn't make it easy. No, no. But at Co Live, which is the largest organization of co living professionals, we have a definition for co living, and it is a freely chosen primary residence form of living that accommodates three or more biologically unrelated people. So let's break this down. When I say is a freely chosen place that you want to be, this already takes out a few types of shared living accommodation, like, uh, for example, forced shared accommodation, like a prison or a hospital. Mm. Those are not considered co-living spaces. And the second point, it's a primary residence. So it's the place that you're at the most. The third point, three or more biologically unrelated people. So this takes away the idea of, you know, a family household is not considered a co-living space. The design of co-living spaces often take on many shapes and sizes, but almost all of them are centered around the idea of sharing, balancing the private and public spaces under one roof. But what about places like hotels, hostels or campsites? Mm -hmm. Are they co-living spaces? I don't consider them co-living spaces. I mean, you are co-living, I guess you can say, but it's not a primary residence. For example, a campsite, maybe you're there for the weekend or for a week. Hostel, same thing. It's it's your, part of your travel accommodation, so you're probably going somewhere next. Co-living space, many of the residents inside a co-living space would perhaps be a digital nomad that is working from a space. Maybe, okay, let's give an example. Mm. Let's just say I wanted to move to beautiful Lisbon, Portugal. And I don't know anybody there. All I know is that I can work remotely and I love the sunshine. Mm. So what I could do is go online and search many co-living spaces that are in Lisbon, Portugal. And from there, all I have to do is show up with my suitcase and I'm automatically in a space with like-minded people, with uh, a place to rest, to have my bed. Um, it's a nice, beautiful design building or living area. And there's already an embedded community in the space. And mm. I can already be part of it. And, you know, from there, build up friendships and, you know, have this amazing accommodation that is uh, super convenient for me because I moved there and I didn't want to bring an entire IKEA bed set with me. Maybe you get this uh, question quite often, but when I just think about it right now, uh, I'm really tempted to ask about the difference between the co-living and co-housing. Can we differentiate those two somehow? Yes. So we can basically differentiate it in a very simple way. Co-housing includes households that are living separately, but then sharing common resources, for example, a garden or the barbecue or the daycare down the street, perhaps. Co-living is, is really all under one roof. And most of the people are, they're single or perhaps with a, one partner. But I guess you can sort of differentiate it because co-housing often has, again, one roof, your own accommodation and some shared resources. Whereas with co-living spaces, Everybody is under one roof. You have your own, you know, bedroom. Maybe you, you have your own bathroom. But other than that, everything is shared. So I guess you can say our co-living is co-housing to the next level. <laughs> so it's something that is one step forward, as you can put it. So the co-living is something that, that you are interested in. And Co-Live is a global organization that you, you're a part of. Could you just uh, share something more about this organization, about CoLive, and what does it actually stand for? Absolutely. So if you haven't heard of CoLive before and you're in the co-living industry, you should definitely check it out. It's the global nonprofit organization, ecosystem, and do tank. And our mission is to connect, empower, and educate the co-living industry worldwide. So we have a network of different types of co-living professionals, everything from operators, founders, real estate investors, developers, designers, architects, you name it, policymakers even, <laughs> and uh, co-livers themselves. And they're all part of this network. What we do is we run multiple events throughout the year. 
We also conduct research projects. We also have a community platform. And recently, we also started offering training for co-living spaces, whether it be to build up like their you know, community management program or user experience or even consult on, on spatial design. And what I love about this, this network is it's global. We have ambassadors that are around the world and we have a, a very active WhatsApp group as well. And people are always sharing their ideas and getting feedback on projects and so on. So it's a really supportive group of people. And it's just our mission to, to help bring co-living to the next level because we truly believe that it is you know, a positive form of living that can bring so much positivity to people, individuals, families, communities, cities, and beyond. I know that uh, my podcast is listened to by many people connected to the design industry and architecture industry. So we are talking here about designers, architects, and of course, urban planners uh, or urbanists. What can they learn uh, from being part of this, of this group of people who are very passionate about co-living? So I mean, is there a way that they can translate it into their design of our cities? Absolutely. I mean, if you speak to founders of co-living spaces, oftentimes they do come with the best intention of bringing, putting community at the center of the space. So how that translates into the design is so important. And, uh, you know, of course, from there, there's other partners, for example, that are in prop tech that also play a big role in the design of the space. How will people use it? And sort of what does their journey look like as they navigate that space? So I think there's a lot of overlap where designers can really dig into the you know future or the user profiles of people that live in the space and how can they make their experience seamless and mm. also generate these you know opportunities to connect with people because again that's part of the whole purpose behind co-living is to have these spaces to connect or those spaces not to connect and retreat if you want to so i think there's like a really cool opportunity to play with the design there and see what makes sense to share and what makes sense to make public or private and so on so i think it's a a really cool um space to test out and try out new ideas. I feel like um, this sharing in general, sharing of resources, sharing of living space is really on the rise, is on the agenda if we discuss how we develop our cities. But I can't not ask about the purpose of co-living and is it exactly for everyone? I remember recording a conversation for this podcast about co-housing and there also one of my key questions was, but is it for everyone? And now we already discussed that co-living is even a step more, like a step further into sharing things. So could it be for everyone or not necessarily? My short answer is no, <laughs> it's not for everyone. <laughs> But I will say, even if you're, let's say, not the co-living type, I would still consider it, it an ideal temporary solution for anyone who is, you know, moving to a new city and doesn't know anyone, like my example earlier, because you have this immediate community and, and people around you to perhaps then make friends with and have a, you know, regular living situation that's not completely shared. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is, is no, it's not for everyone. Yeah, you should Definitely, if you're if you're considering moving into co-living space, make your make your own decision whether you're the right person for it or not. Some people don't necessarily like having a space that's already been pre-designed, you know, and maybe they want to have their own touch to it. And many of these co-living spaces are sort of ready, set for you to go and and live. And I know from you know my experience and also speaking with others, they would rather be part of building the space or, you know, growing the space themselves and having a bigger input in how it's run and what it looks like and what is shared and what's not. So mm. maybe it depends also on, yeah, just where 
where you are at in life. A lot of people often say, okay, this is just, this is for young people. They're going to go out and meet people and they're feeling social yeah. and want to go out. But, you know, it's also, it's not just for, it's not a, you know, demographic. It's a, it's a mindset. Whether you're, you're in your 50s or 60s and you maybe want a more social life, you can also consider a co-living space. It's not a generational. That was exactly the direction I wanted to go. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, to go with because I'm very interested in some patterns. So, but you say that it's not really tied to the demographics, but can't you say that there is a group of people for example, younger people, or is it anyhow tied to, to gender? I know that there is some studies, some data about uh, how it is with co-housing, right? You could hear about like senioral co-housing or a co-housing that is created only by, by some women. So do we have any this type of data for co-living or maybe do you know any data about that? To be honest, I don't have the data to share right now and I don't want to share misinformation. Mm. We can always add a link mm -hmm. later after the conversation. So if, if there is something you will find after. Let me take a look into uh, research that I have on file and I can drop a link in so you can share it with uh, the listeners afterwards and they can take a look at the statistics that we have. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, let's, let's do that. But do you have some like your own feelings? Like when you talk uh, to many people within your network, do you feel like it's mostly youngsters or it's hard to actually observe uh, a pattern tied to demographics or gender and so on? So if you walk into most co-living spaces, you will see, I mm. guess, a younger demographic, mm. 20s to 30s. Often it's like an international crew, not always, you know, only locals in, in one co-living space. It's often a, a blend and a mix. I think that's cool to connect with others and connect with the community. And I do see a lot of remote workers that are in the co-living spaces because they had this flexibility to, you know, pick up and go and live somewhere else. So uh, those are some trends that I, I definitely see. And most people are, again, just either single or they're with a partner. Those are the, the trends that I, I see when I give a, a very umbrella view of the people mm -hmm. that are in the space. Definitely think that it's a great, great opportunity for someone who is just moving to a new city. And I would love to have this opportunity before when I was uh, moving out to Sweden to study. I managed to find people to live with, but I guess that in such a co-living situation, it would be even more fun to have like a, a, like a bigger group. And here I wanted to ask you if there is any, a limit in number if it comes to co-living, because is there like a setup, a framework for a co-living situation? Because I can imagine that when we talk about like, for example, a hostel, right, or some kind of a co-working place, there is a, a limit of people that can join. Does co-living also have some limits if it comes to the numbers? Like, of course, it can be limited by the physical space, but can it be that maybe it's kind of more spread out outside only one one physical space, so to say, one room or one uh, one apartment or one house? Yeah, I think that I'm looking for an answer to the question, which is like, how physically can we frame co-living? Mm -hmm. Great question. So no matter the size of the co-living space, whether it be for five people or even for 500 people, mm -hmm. what you will see happen is clusters forming on, for example, each floor. So even if you have, for example, so many people under one roof in one gigantic building, you'll notice that the people on each floor are sort of forming their own smaller communities. And, or tribes. Yeah, or <laughs> tribes. They're still getting that deep connection with people because, let's say, there's, mm. I don't know, let's say there's 30 people, for example. They still uh, have that opportunity to have these deep connections with people and not, you know, have this pressure to have mm. such, you know, ties with all 400 other residents that are in the building. Like I said, no matter what the size, you will see as the size does get larger, clusters will form. And these sort of micro communities will also form. And here I w would like to also ask about some challenges. And first, I would like to ask about the challenges that co-living does address. We already talked about people who might feel a bit lost while moving to, to a new city. But are there any other challenges that it can address? Well, I think when we, we talk about cities and 
space in cities or lack of space in cities or lack of housing, co-living is a solution for the housing crisis and challenge of, let's say, not enough space in cities. So, for mm. example, just the, the general setup and, and building structure of a co-living space allows you to have more people living under one roof than you would in, for example, I don't know, a standard housing situation. So mm. with that, there is more space for people to live and work and be in a city and contribute to the city and the surroundings. So I, I think that uh, definitely this, this sort of the spatial opportunities that co-living can bring is super cool. I had the opportunity to go to Hong Kong in 2019 to visit a co-living space there. And I thought it was super cool how they took the challenge of, you know, not enough space and got super creative with how they designed the bedrooms, the shared living spaces and so on. So I think just the designers did a really great job at turning a challenge into an opportunity and getting super creative and in the end, of course, housing more people. Who develops and organizes uh, such a co-housing because I can just imagine that it also takes up uh, a lot of resources in terms of uh, materials, if you would like to uh, build something yourself or furnish and design the place, and also money if you would like to own or rent a place for, for such a co-living community. Well, of course, the developers play a huge role, and often you see developers and operators working hand in hand to bring the co-living space mm. to life. So while the developers deal with the land and the building itself, uh, the operators mm. are the ones that are, are really bringing the, the soul into the space. They're the ones bringing in the brand and the whole community framework. So this collaboration is, is super key. And I think it's would also be super cool to involve more of these sort of future residents in the initial stages of the project development because maybe they could bring forward new ideas or perspectives that weren't thought of from a you know general business point of view, I guess you can say. And does it bring any challenges? Because I think that such an investment, of course, can bring some benefits. And this is something that I would like to just discuss in a minute. But first, do you know of any challenges that actually developing co-living might bring? I think with any new development, it could bring in some challenges. Mm -hmm. For example, if there's already, you know, an existing neighborhood or thriving area and then, you know, co-living space pops up out of nowhere, I think this could be a challenge to integrate with the community and, you know, how can they be more part of I guess you can say, of the co-living space. So it goes hand in hand. I also think when it comes to infrastructure, for example, in co-living spaces, prop tech plays a huge role. And oftentimes, uh, you know, for hardware, like even, uh, for example, locks or even uh, software like Wi-Fi setups and everything, oftentimes these are not afterthoughts, but sort of like taken into consideration later in the process which could bring up some challenges that wouldn't have happened if they were brought in earlier in the in the phase of the development. I'm trying to just uh, look from the perspective of such a developer and uh, we might think about a commercial developer, but maybe just someone who gets inspired or who got inspired mm -hmm. to create their own uh, co-living space. Mm -hmm. What challenges they might meet on the way and what benefits can it bring? And while discussing here with you, Kristen, I feel like such a co-living community might bring a lot of benefits, commercial as well, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of finance and, and money, mm -hmm. because it contributes to developing um, a space. And I mean here the placemaking in our cities. And I know that you are also work working a lot with that. So you are trying to connect the co-living with placemaking while leading the plot twist placemaking, which is your own entrepreneurial journey, could you also introduce this idea to us and how do you connect placemaking with co-living? Absolutely. So yes, I started plot twist placemaking to help 
shared living models activate spaces for well-being, flexibility, and transformational experiences. And this includes everything from what we're talking about now with co-living, co-working, student housing, and public spaces. And the plot twist is surprise (laughs) or unexpected (laughs) refreshment or charm of, of bringing underutilized spaces to life. And when we talk about the crossover between co-living and placemaking, this is really the, the sweet spot that um, gets me super mm. excited because from my research in, in both the realms of co-living and urban innovation, and I see a lot of untapped potential in, in the crossover mm. between real estate, like co-living spaces, and their surrounding public spaces. So placemaking activations are often temporary, but the good thing is, they don't have to be. Placemaking can also take on more of like a, a long-term form and be a solution to help connect buildings and developments mm. with the surrounding environment and you know really create place-led developments and activations for people that are living around there to create a sense of community, not only outside of the building, but also integrating with the neighborhood. And ultimately, that's the whole, the goal to bring social value to the surrounding environment and also a nice place to live. Then let's try to answer the question for 100 points, which is about my kind of favorite framework, so to speak, so the urban one, uh, because I would love to ask you what influence can co-living and placemaking bring to our cities? Well, you're creating you're creating neighborhoods. The sort of the sense of community goes beyond the the kitchen in the co-living space, <laughs> it goes way beyond that. And that's sort of what I'm trying to also explore further and, and see how we can also get this word out a little bit more. <laughs> but um, yeah, with placemaking in general and furthermore, place-led developments, which are more long-term visions for placemaking and the crossover between city-making, mm. community development and placemaking, there's so much opportunity there to create places for for individuals for families for everyone that's in the neighborhood to to thrive and contribute to and be part of something bigger so Mm -hmm. i think that the social value that place-led development can bring to not only a park nearby but also the co-living space for example that's next to it and you know the the old man that has been living uh, across the street for how you know sixty years. How can we connect people and connect people through space, and in the end, contribute to making the space a better place mm. to to live? Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, yes, I think that I think that you did. And here, I would like to develop this thread and ask about the. Uh, um, the cities that are really good at co-living because uh, maybe through your own observations or maybe talking to over 5,000 members, co-living professionals that are part of co have you heard about the cities that are really on top of their game if it comes to uh, developing co-living as a form of living and as well investing in the in the space making and place making? Yeah, which cities are, are really investing into those? If you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, top of the charts, hands down, I would say London. There if you if you type in even online like co living spaces London, you'll get whole many pages of, of results because they are um, you know, of course, the housing situation there is not necessarily not necessarily as accessible as you would want it to be. And uh, there's also a lot of international people going there and so on. So London definitely tops my list of cities that are really embracing co-living and don't quote me although i know i'm being recorded for this podcast but i I believe also london was one of the first cities to pass some very important sort of zoning laws to allow this type of housing because in some cities for example co-living is is still let's say not proven enough or the the model's not been proved enough to legitimize it for certain you know, zoning regulations and so on. So it has brought up other challenges for some cities to even get their foot in the door with co-living. 
since we already discussed the type of people who are really attracted by co-living and placemaking as well, my last question would be about gentrification and preventing it. Do you see yourself any proofs of that this way of, of co-living and placemaking contributes to, to gentrification? And if that is anyhow avoidable? I think that getting the neighbors that are, you know, for example, living in the area of where there will be a new development, having them on board with the public space, like building up, co-creating the public space that will be in the surrounding area could be a, a good step to mm. keep them as part of the process. Also, I mean, it is possible, I guess, that, you know, with more people moving there, there will be more need. So maybe there is going to be more coffee shops <laughs> popping up around the corner <laughs> or cafes or other places created nearby to suit those those preferences. But I think from to go back to my first point, keeping the sort of like the neighborhood involved or at least, you know, communicate <laughs> communicate the changes so that they don't just wake up one day and there's a you know a whole new development in their backyard. To add some literature to that um, and some studies maybe, one question will be, the last one will be about the book recommendation, mm -hmm. but I know that also you have a pretty interesting overview that you wanted to share, which is about the place-led development. Yes. Could you share it with the listeners? Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, place-led development is also a topic that I'm in the process of exploring deeper and on a deeper level. And I came across this amazing overview of place-led development. It's called creating vibrant communities and human skilled areas. And this was co-created by Stipo Hunk and Placemaking Europe. Uh, I'll, I'll drop you the link as well to share, but you know, basically this overview also shares tools to use throughout the different stages of the project. Mm. So it describes place-led development as the creation of places where people want to be, places that consider the human skill, the city at eye level, and social life. I think that if, if you are interested in this topic, take a look at this great overview. And if you want to talk further about it and, and pass some ideas back and forth, uh, let me know. <laughs> yes, definitely. And then the, the last thing, last but not least, of mm -hmm. course, is the book recommendation. Uh, could you share something which, uh, of course, ideally could be connected to the topic of our discussion? Mm -hmm. I've been going back and forth between uh, two books. <laughs> what I'm going to say as my, my top choice is called The Art of Gathering, How We Meet and Why It Matters. It's by Priya Parker. The reason I'm going to recommend this is because it's all about sort of intentional communities from small scale, like, uh, you know, organizing dinner party with friends to much larger scale. So this can bring some, if you start with why and why you want to bring people together, this is a great book to um, generate some great ideas. So this is basically something that might inspire people to start co-living uh, themselves. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I hope so. But uh, this is really about just being, you know, building communities and in, in general and in many forms, not only in terms of accommodation, but it, it goes way beyond the basic limits of, of <laughs> a kitchen or a living room. <laughs> I like it because I think it's uh, way beyond urbanism and cities. And I like uh, when my guests are recommending books that are not really tied to urbanism, because then I also can just buy them and read them. And I think that I will do, um, <laughs> do exactly this time. So thank you for that recommendation. Of course. And thank you as well for, for the conversation, uh, Kristen. I think that it was very inspiring to hear about your story about co-living that you've been actually chasing around the world and uh, knowing your story, you ended up in the Netherlands. But do you have any other a dream now, any stop on your on your journey that you would like to develop? <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because actually the reason why I came to the Netherlands was to explore this idea of, of shared living. And it is my dream to one day have my own type of shared accommodation. What that looks like is mm. uh, still not clear. But I think, you know, with all this knowledge I've been absorbing over the years, working in the industry and speaking to so many inspirational founders and developers of, of really cool spaces and not only co-living spaces, co-housing spaces, but also more, uh, you know, let's say like short term, boutique hostel accommodation, this kind of thing. 
So it's uh, every day my my eyes are are getting wider and wider as I I dream up some ideas for my future space, which I would love to develop some point here in the Netherlands. Christian, so I really wish that your dream and your vision for a short living project in Amsterdam will come true. And I really wanted to say thank you for uh, for being part of Herbcast and sharing all, all your brilliant thoughts. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for being here. I'm glad that you're listening to this outro. I just wanted to say, as always, that I'm very glad that you've listened to this episode. And if you got inspired about co-living and would like to maybe start your own initiative or get to know even more, feel free to reach out to Kristen. I added the link to her profile on LinkedIn and also website uh, just in this episode's description. If you would like to get to know about Herbcast a bit more, you can visit me on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram, all also at my website called herbcast.pl slash en for English. Thank you for being here one more time. I really appreciate your support and talk to you very soon. Mm-hmm.